Hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Intentional Pathways by Design, where we are talking everything relationships, both personal and business. And today I, would, I am so excited to introduce you to my featured guest, Melanie Ake, founder of Everyday Leaders. How are you doing today, Melanie? Hi, Kimberly. I am so excited to be here. When you asked me, I said, yes, absolutely. <laughs> you have amazing programs and I just really believe in what you're doing. So thank you for including me. This is awesome. Absolutely. And, and it is an absolute honor to have you here because you are um, that everyday leader. And I'm so excited for you to be sharing with the audience today um, about leadership. So with that being said, let's go ahead and let's just dive in. And we're going to start out with a quote. These quotes are so powerful. Um, and our quote today is from Brene Brown. And who doesn't love Brene Brown? But we really want to learn about your feedback. Okay. Yeah. So I feel like I'm on a game show. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this channel is all about <laughs> educating and entertaining because when we're taking in information, you know, it's important. You, and you know, this as a leader, it's important to not only take in that in, or to read the information or to listen to the information, but also to take it in and let it saturate and sink in. And so what better way to do that than be fun and yes. engaging? <laughs> so I love it. I'm ready. <laughs> let's get to it. Um, empathy is simply listening, holding space, withholding judgment, emotionally connecting, and communicating that incredibly healing message of you're not alone. Brene Brown. So if you could discuss this in terms of leadership, we would uh, absolutely love that. Uh, okay. Here's my lesson, right? We talk about this every single day on my morning devotionals. It is the ability to have the capacity within yourself to grow as a leader, to knowing it's not about you, first of all, right? It's not about you. The second thing is because it's not about you, the 15 laws of growth teaches, right? Chapter three is it's about how we view ourselves. Mm -hmm. So having empathy is able to see ourselves as givers, as servant leaders, and really living that so that you, when you have, when you have to experience empathy, when you have to give empathy, it's not something that you have to do. It's not a checklist. It's something of who you are, right? So meeting the other person where they are, being able to have the capacity in your own growth to just do this naturally, not a switch of, oh, I need to practice that now because this happened. It's every day you're developing those skills. So, you know, John Maxwell, my mentor always talks about this lesson of putting a 10 on everyone's head, mm. right? So if you could see somebody, not how you really see them, give them the ability, give them the, the permission to be the best person that you see in the world. And when you do that, you immediately connect to your heart. You have compassion. You want to listen. You're not going to speak first. You're going to listen. You're going to really step into what they need at that moment. So that's my lesson on that. I, I think all of those things are so important and none can be accomplished in a single moment. They have to be learned and it all has to go together in parallel. Mm, so powerful. That was absolutely so powerful. Can you repeat that? Cause I'm not sure, not the whole thing, but the piece about not just doing it as a checklist, but becoming it. Mm -hmm. Let's and go into that a little bit more. What does it mean to become empathy? You know, you, 
first of all, you have to know yourself. So I'm always going to reference the 15 laws of growth. That is my, that is my personal growth book that has changed my life. So when I uh, reference all the time in groups, chapters, I'll chapter two, chapter 10, chapter eight, this goes back to the awareness part and, and what our intentions are from our heart, right? So if we have a belief about ourself, we're not going to be able to be aware of anybody else's needs. Mm. So be able, being able to learn that every day, it's not just, oh, I took a class and I did this because Kimberly, you and I both know anytime you attend something, when you walk out that door, when you turn off zoom, you lose 70% of that information. Mm -hmm. So this is about leaning in and actually deciding intentionally that you're going to grow, that you want to improve your capacity to connect with people. We could talk about, you know, everyone communicates, few connect. That's another book that I teach, but it is about having that ability to open your heart and see someone else, not just, you know, what they're doing every day, but what their purpose really is, what they're trying maybe to get to that they haven't reached yet. Maybe they don't have mentors. Maybe they don't have a capacity for learning. Maybe they have been labeled in a certain way that has given them this belief that they can't do it right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're that voice that says, it's okay. I can hear you. You are heard. And I believe that you can do anything you want to do. And sometimes it's just being the resource for them to find that next thing, to connect to that right person, to have the right materials, to give them the freedom that nobody else has given them. I think that's practicing empathy. Mm. Woo. Hopefully everyone has their pens and paper <laughs> out because we just started this fantastic conversation. This is my jam and I love this. Um, I love this and I don't think we can not talk about it enough, right? We don't talk about it enough. You know, and thank goodness for leaders like you, um, for this quote uh, by Brene Brown and all of the wonderful work that she's done in the area of uh, empathy um, and the importance of it in the workplace, because, oh my goodness, let's continue to talk about this. And if we hear it enough, right, maybe it will inspire more people to become empathy. I love that. It's, it's just not empathy as a checklist. It's becoming empathy. Oh and my if, goodness. You know what they say is the, when the student is ready, the teacher appears, mm -hmm. right? So we can hear things a million times. The two-year-olds were always taught like, don't touch that. Don't touch that. Don't touch that until they burn their hand. They're going to keep touching it. <laughs> right. So <laughs> I love that. I love that because how many times as an adult, do we touch the stove, Right. How many times as an adult do we touch the stove? And it's like, we touch the stove and it's like, hmm, is it the second, the third, the fourth time that we're going to learn, don't touch the stove? You know, are we going to learn that lesson? Right. You know, mm -hmm. well, now is the time. Today is the day. <laughs> I mean, it affects everything. You think about those five spheres of our life, right? Our health, if we eat the wrong things we keep doing it and doing it and doing it until we go, oh, there's a symptom that's popping up that tells me I shouldn't do that. Or we decide we want to make a change for the better. So then we decide that that's going to improve. It's spiritual growth. It's financial growth, right? Oh, I keep bouncing checks. Well, why do you do that? Because you haven't paid attention to what's important, right? Everybody goes through this at every kind of sphere in a relationship and communication in your workplace. And sometimes, you know, you get put and if you'd go to the work area, you may be in cubicles working with people that don't feel the same way you do. They don't have the same values. They don't have the same religious background. They don't have the same community beliefs, yet you're on these teams that you have to function together. Mm -hmm. So that empathy part is so important because, you know, if you're going to commit to the work that you're doing and you believe in the work that you're doing and what Simon Sinek teaches too, is having a safe workplace right? Being able to feel safe means you have empathy and you practice that. And I think you have to, you just have to learn, right? You have to grow as an individual, as a leader to be able to uh, accomplish that every day. So 
Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So good. But let's jump in. And if you could, Melanie, could you um, define leadership for us? What is leadership? Define that. So what I have learned all these years is sometimes, right. And let's go back to the workplace because we always think like, what did our parents do? Who were the people that influenced us to make us feel like leadership was about success? Mm -hmm. Right. And so that may look like, well, well, if you're a bank teller or you're um, an engineer, or if you're a doctor or a lawyer, right. So we try to achieve those things based on a job description. And we say, well, that's got to be, if, if I achieve that, then I'm going to have success. Although leadership isn't about those titles. It's not about the job description. I believe it is about the heart to serve. And I think when we get that right, no matter what level we are, no matter what capacity we have in our life, if we're not gifted with, you know, the knowledge part and we're, we're not reading every day, or we haven't been gifted with having, you know, a positive community around us, I think it doesn't matter. It goes to your heart. And if your heart is developed to serve people, then you have the capacity of leadership in your life. And that's that's where it comes from. It's thinking of that other person first in everything that you do. And that's what defines to me, that's what defines leadership. Mm. So interesting. So, oh, so much is coming up for me. <laughs> um, so much is coming up for me in this because I think oftentimes we get the, the boss and the leader confused you know, especially in the corporate space. I think there's a lot of people that have titles um, that look at themselves as leaders. Um, and we have to be really careful in that. So that leads me to the, our next question. What is the difference between a leader and a boss? <laughs> Sometimes you have both. <laughs> <laughs> many, many times you do not. Right. And, and it goes back to the position that they have. So it could be the person that has developed a company. Let's just take, this is the, the owner, right? The owner of a company, they may be the boss because they had the vision to be able to bring this together, but what's their vision for, mm -hmm. right? So when we talk about this, what did they see as to be successful. Again, let's go back to what success looks like. If success to them look like I'm going to serve myself, be financially wealthy, have people underneath of me, I can boss, have a community that, you know, that takes orders for me, have political power, you know, be able to influence laws because I've opened something that is going to matter that I can get attention for mm -hmm. versus gosh, I'm doing something in a community where I can serve others. So no matter if they are your boss title or they are the owner of the company or they're, they're your boss of your division, if they come to you with, it's the community idea, we need to understand how we're developing our people first. So our people can tell us, how do we need to serve our customers? How do we create opportunities for us to grow in the community as a business? So we're taking that example, but as a business how do we brand ourselves so that we're looked at as a servant company, mm. right? Jeff Henderson, I'm teaching this right now in one of my groups. And, and we talk about the voices that we use and it's because it's how we naturally show up. Mm. So you can have a bad boss that has a, you know, how they present is it's all about them yet with growth, right? For leadership and growth is, can I see myself again, go back to chapter two awareness are we aware that what we're doing isn't as effective as it could be if we really took on this servant leadership role? And, and, you know, that title gets thrown around all the time Yet I think practicing it again, owning that process is where it starts. And it's really hard for a lot of people because they have, again, beliefs, right? They've been, they believe their whole life that I can't accomplish anything if I don't have a company or I don't have a title, or if I'm not running people, if I'm not, if I'm, if I'm not the one that's presenting the information about our company, because I, I have insecurities, right? Nobody else can do it as good as me. 
And, and so we're not going to keep the customers if I'm not the one that is sharing the information. And so a lot of that is like just stepping back and being able to be vulnerable and be humble enough to think maybe somebody else has a better idea. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody else has a, a, an ability to see or catch my vision and make it even better and, and do things that are going to bring more people along for the journey. And, and that's really what I, I feel, you know, again, it goes back to your heart. Do you care about people? Mm -hmm. Do you care enough about giving people the opportunity? You know, do you trust them? Which is a big thing with a lot of leaders. They feel insecure and saying, well, I have this title and I don't want anybody to come into my glass ceiling room like this. I have achieved this. Right. And so that, um, that kind of a mindset, you may be there for 10 years. You may be there for your whole life. Will you have a productive and happy life? What Simon talks about all the time, will you come to work happy and will you leave fulfilled? Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I, I believe now this is my view, but I believe if you go into the world saying, I need that glass ceiling office. I'm not going to be happy if the boss doesn't approve what I do. I won't be happy unless I get that title. I won't be happy unless I get that promotion. I won't be happy if I get into this job and see those job descriptions and I don't achieve this by this time. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with being an achiever, but it's not about that job description. It's, it's connecting to the people that, that you can influence. And we'll talk about influence, but impacting them in a way that knows that you care about them and that you care about what they care about. That's, you know, that's the empathy part. And so it all just ties in together, but we can't do it. It's not just compartmentalized, right? Not mm -hmm. one thing is going to help you be successful. You have to really get perspective around this so that you can understand where am I needing to grow more? And so that's what you work on. And John Maxwell talks about this all the time is working on our strengths, not our weaknesses. Work on the things that you know you're, you're really strong in. So if you're a good connector, if you are good at um, communicating, if you're good at teamwork, if you're good at just being right, empathetic to people, do that more. Find ways to, to help other people be better at that. And that's where you pass on that legacy. So the significance of leadership is, you know, realizing that and then, and then sharing that. Mm. Yeah, so, so important and so powerful, but always learning, always having that mindset. I know for me, it's always learning, always growing. It's like, you know, here I am doing this, but didn't realize that it could, this process or this procedure or what I'm doing could even be better than that. And instead of coming from the place, oh, wow, like, really? Yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, give it to me you know, like give it to me. And I love when you were talking about John Maxwell, I love, I think it was a podcast that I was listening to. And it was one specific where you said, you know, he was the idea person, you know, but he wants people on his team that are going to execute that idea. Right. And I love that. I love that. So before we dive in um, to our next question, can you speak about that? You know, to those leaders that have the ideas that are visionaries, um, but at the same time, don't necessarily haven't found those idea people. Do you have mm -hmm. any um, advice for them, how they can, um, as they're continuing to grow themselves as that servant leader, how they can attract more idea people? Oh, gosh, you know, it's about it's about showing up and communicating your vision. And I think a lot of times people say, you know, I, I have this idea or I'm going to work on this and I'm just going to be consumed with it. I'm going to stay in my office 50 hours a day. And, and when I get to be to where I see it's perfection, then I'll reach out and get resources only if I trust them, only if they do it my way, only if they, you know, can see exactly how I want it executed. And yet here's the thing that we know about that process is it doesn't work because every time you start to test something for the first time, it's not going to be what you end up with. <laughs> and so having the capacity to say like, I need other visionaries. I need other idea people. I need to do, you know, small groups. I need to test this. I need to trial this. This is why I'm big 
you know, when I've been exposed to medical device companies, we, we had, um, you know, customer research teams and it was about what the customer felt because when you design something, it's just like on Shark Tank, right? I love this example, but going on Shark Tank, watching all those people that have invested their life, $3 million, right? And the evaluation of the company is like hundred million dollars. And they come in, they ask for a percentage and they don't really have a vision because they haven't brought anybody else in. Like mm-hmm. I've worked on this, I've dedicated, I've gave up my degrees and gave up my family because I wanted to do this. Yet they never ask anybody else what their perspective was, right? And so only having your vision, it prevents you from being successful tenfold. You mm-hmm. may be successful for that little bit, for that little group that you can actually connect to, but having the multiplication of people in your life that, that you pass that vision on to, it's the legacy, mm-hmm. right? That's where the success goes. And, you know, you think about um, all these products and these brands that have been pushed out and through, and through COVID, right? Some of them have been successful, continued success because they were able to pivot, and they knew what they were, were doing wasn't going to be sustainable because the environment changed. And, and so, you know, there's so many examples of that, yet we all know who they are in our communities. And some businesses had to shut down because of it, because they only saw one way, you know, Chick-fil-A added, added more lanes to oh, what they gosh. knew to do because they were already planning for that. They knew they needed to serve the customers in a bigger way to be more efficient, you know, McDonald's started to do that in our areas because they saw the, how that was working. Other companies, you know, they said, if you can't, if we can't have people come inside, we can't do this anymore. We can't serve um, what we do. And so it, it caused a lot of, you know, you saw what leaders would do and, and you saw how others would react. And so I think that's it. But as a leader, if you're going to be in this position and you want to be successful in owning a business or being um, a voice in a company, a visionary, you've got to be able to know, you know, how to try things, how to learn from what is actually happening in the environment today, because every best plan is only as good as its execution, right? It's not good on paper, but you have to execute it. So getting the people on the ground floor that can say, well, if something changes, then what is our plan? I hate plan B. I hate you say even plan B, but <laughs> what are we going to do? You know, if we have to, do we have the right people that can pivot and then see the vision to do that? You know, Jeff Henderson is a great example. He was the marketing director for Chick-fil-A and his story is about the cows, right? The little plastic cows. And, and so when they won the game, they threw the cows out on the field and he thought, and he as he tells the story, I thought I was so fired. Like I knew that I was just, I was sinking in my suit and I knew that I just needed to go find another job. Yet they came to him and said, that was the most ingenious thing that you ever did. It's the most ingenious thing that we ever thought about because now we branded ourselves. Now, every time they have a game and they went, they want the cows, right? It wasn't something that was a distraction. It was something that actually added value in a unique way so that when people knew how to pivot, right? Now we think of the cows at Chick-fil-A. Well, that doesn't make any sense logically, right? Yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> but it's that brand, right? And I remember traveling to Florida and you would see the little Chick-fil-A house and you'd be like, I have to go to that one because it's the only one. And, and yet here we go. The story, right? The, the story of why they made that decision and pivoting was really important. And it created the momentum for them to, to catch that vision. So I love stories like that because where will you be at that time when you need to pivot? Are you the visionary or are you the person that is providing the resources to say, Hey, this person can help us or this person, or I watched this, or I saw this, maybe we should try this, right? There's never like an exact plan, but it's giving you yourself and your company the permission to bring the people on board that can help you create something that may look different, that can help you touch different audiences. So that was a long answer, but, <laughs> but no. there's so much packed into it, right? There's just so many ways that, um, that you can't stay in that just isolated. I know it all. It's going to go the exact way that I want to. It never works out that way. And so you've, you've got to put the right people around you, no matter what you're doing. If you're just doing one job still, can you give that away and use your time in a better way? 
to create bigger ideas. Mm. And that's, that's kind of the lesson, right? Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So, so, so good. So going back to that empathy piece, how can we be sure that we are showing up as an empathetic leader? Oh my gosh. I think asking, right? That's the biggest thing. Like, am I meeting your needs as a boss, like taking surveys and checking in with people and especially through COVID, you know, even if you're still on zoom, you're still doing virtual, maybe hybrid stuff. It's really having the opportunity to connect to those people one-on-one having the ability, you know, to have safe out, um, out meetings or still going to do activities that are included or have, I've seen people do social, you know, dinners together on zoom and, and bring your favorite foods, right. And being able to share what you have, um, maybe as, as a personal, uh, this is what I love. And this is why I love it or show and tell. I've seen a uh, lots of companies do that uh, or bring different speakers in that'll give you different ways to think about stuff. And, and because now it's more accessible than ever, but it, and giving your team opportunities to say, this is what we would like to have, or this is what we're missing. This is the gap socially isolated that we feel being on virtual that we really would like this. Sometimes it's just asking those questions. Mm -hmm. What do you need? Where are you feeling isolated? Mental health comes up all the time, right? A lot of people haven't ever felt like this before. Some people still live alone. They don't have a companion to go to when Zoom goes off. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is really where they live and they've experienced so much of it. It's this overstimulation of, of everything. And so then they go to social media, they go to Facebook and LinkedIn and, and TikTok, and, and they feel like that's the world they live in. And when they walk outside of their door, it's really hard for them to just adjust. Right. Um, so I, I think it's really, we have a responsibility as leaders of companies to make sure that our teams are mentally healthy, prepared, that we're giving them the resources that they need, even if it's not us doing it but providing the resources as those outlets so that they can, they can stay healthy and do the work that we need them to do so they can be creative when we need to pivot. Oh my goodness. And, and we will, we'll continue to need the skill, right. Of pivoting. If we want to use that word or just having that new way we can move the company, you know, in a different direction, but being flexible and being creative and just being open to it, knowing that it's not always going to be this way. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, nothing's linear. No. We know, right. You, we've lived long enough <laughs> that <Yeah>. we know <laughs> nothing just goes in a straight line. So you're always saying, you know, who do I listen to? And in companies, this is why we have meetings every week, mm-hmm. right? This is why we have meetings for feedback, because we know there have been instances that have changed. There's been customer relations that need to be taken care of. There's been products that have been developed that need to be launched. And so as we decide, like, what's the right order to do all these things in and who's going to be responsible for helping us get there, if people aren't in the right mindset in your company, they can't go as fast as your vision. They, they can't go as fast as your vision. So you've got to, you've got to really help that relationship part. Um, you know, it, it's, it's about the gratitude of understanding who's really got your back on your team. And, and that comes from you having their back. So that empathy is huge. Mm. Oh my goodness. Audience, I don't know about you, but this was jam, jam packed. And I know your notepads are full. And if they're not, go back, rewind and sit down and just really breathe this in, breathe it in. Um, If you're an aspiring leader, if you're currently a leader, um, even if you're a leader and um, you're kind of at the end of your career and you're looking at creating something new, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button and put those comments um, down there in the chat because, you know, Melanie wants to connect with you um, and we want to make sure that you're receiving the value um, because this conversation was jam-packed full of value. Um, (laughs) Jam-packed. And Melanie, um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Can you let everyone know where they can find you? Yes. Thank you. This has been awesome. Thank you for inviting me. Um, you can find me at everydayleaders.com. That's my website. And if I'm on LinkedIn at Melanie Ake, everyday leaders, 
uh, Instagram, Everyday Leaders 50 and 50, which is my podcast. But uh, go to the website. You can find all kinds of things that are going on, events and speaking events. And uh, I love to help companies through these cultural situations. So if you need something in your company, let me know how I can help you. It's really fun to dive in and see if you've got the right people in the right seats so that you can get your vision done, right? <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Like I said, hit that like button, <laughs> hit that subscribe button and get down there in the comments and share your thoughts. Um, Melanie, again, just absolutely phenomenal. I can't wait for our next conversation. Thank you, Kimberly. Have a great day. You too.